Hi, welcome to Go on the Run. And today we're going to look at building a web application. So far, or in the previous video, for example, I showed you how to do a RESTful endpoint. But I imagine that somehow you had some REST client that would connect to your RESTful endpoint. Today, we're going to work on such a client. We're going to build a simple client that uses our RESTful endpoint to both create users and to get the total number of users. Here I am in my go on the run directory, and I'm going to start off with the last project we did, which was the net HTTP API project. I'll copy that because I still want to create a full web application, which includes both a client and server. So two parts. So I'm going to start with that code, make that my server or backend code, and then I'm going to add the client directory to implement our front end, which is just going to be a very, very simple HTTP client. And so I'm going to write that using some HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. I'm going to call this part one because we're going to be doing several parts of this web application. But as I said before, we're going to create two directories. We need one for our server and we need one for the client, the front end. So we have front end and back end. So let me just create two sub directories and I'll move the main.go and the API directory into the server directory and the client directory will create for our front end. So I don't need to do anything with the server right now. So I'm going to work on the client. I'm going to start by creating an index.html file. Again, writing a simple web client. I'm going to use some templates, code snippet that's already available in Visual Studio Code. So I'm just going to select that by typing HTML, select this set of HTML5 code, and then give my web application a title. And here I can see it's already loading a style sheet and JavaScript file. So I'm going to leave that. I'm going to create those files in a bit. So let's put some text in the client area. And now we have a simple web file. Now we just have to worry about how do we run this? Well, before we do that, let's add our main at CSS and also our main.javascript file. Let's try and run this so we can open it in our web browser. So one way of doing that is to use Python module, the simple HTT module in Python. And of course we have to change to our project directory, but let's just change to the client directory because that's the only thing we want to serve and run simple HTTP server from there. So now that's running on port 8000, we can open up our web browser and go to that port and see our application running. So let me drag a browser on the screen and show that the application is running, that we can access our simple web client using a web browser. This is our application running and it makes sense. We start up, we fired up a web server to serve up the contents of that directory. And so we have an index.html file. So that works fine. If we zoom in a bit so we can see this. Okay. What if we make about if we make some changes? So I'm going to add some text and now I'll wait for it to save. And I go back to my web application and I refresh. And so if I, as I develop, every time I make some change, I'll need to keep refreshing my web browser. So I don't want to do that. Instead, I'm going to install with a plugin here called Live Server, and it's by Ritwick Day. I hope I'm saying his name correctly, but that is one that you can install. There are probably others, but this is the one I installed. And it tells you exactly how to launch it if you have a project with the HTML file. So notice that I do not have the Go Live button shown here on my screen because when I open my project, in Visual Studio Code, at the time, I did not have an HTML file. I created an HTML file after the fact. So if I exit my project and come back, then you'll see a Go Live button at the bottom of the screen. Big enough screen, this is great because then you can show enough of your web application as you develop and you can just make focus on coding and then you can glance and see the result without having to go click on refresh and so on. So it does really help. All right, as you can see, now when I make changes to my HTML file, my web browser updates automatically and I don't have to click refresh explicitly. So we now have our index.html file. And what I like to do is pretend that I'm writing a web application. I have a logo or something. I have some action button on the top left. So I have like this error bar. And then I also have a place to show the total number of users. Eventually, what I'm going to do is add a place to submit in new users. But at first, let's try and just get the number of users that's currently in our database. So for that, well, we don't have a database yet, but let's try and get the number of users from our RESTful endpoint. I'm going to start out by creating a like header section. So I'm going to use a diff for that. My application name in that header diff, but I'm also going to create a separate diffs with some action buttons. So those are going to be for navigating to home, um, showing it's a list of users, for example, or pages with users and showing list of books. Let's imagine that I had that. 
Of course, I don't have that right now, but you can see from this, it's not displaying quite how I'd like. like. I would like to have the logo on the top left and the action button on the top right. So I'll go to the CSS file. What I'd first like to do is put margin for the body element. So that took effect and you can see it loading there, you can see the result. The next thing is I want to focus on the header. And for the header, I want to put some margin at the bottom. That's so that nothing else that I add comes too close to my header. All right. Then I want to focus on the menu. And so I'm going to reference the menu ID for that div. And I want it to display inline instead of a block. If you don't know any of this stuff about CSS, don't worry. Um, and then I want it to float over to the right hand side. Like I said, I want the menu to be on the right. So if I go back and I look, this is sort of what I want, but something looks wrong here. I want to change that to make the heading three not display as a block element, but rather in line. So I'm going to change this display property to, to in line. And once this is saved, you should see that we get the result we expect, which is exactly this. But that's all for the CSS. I don't think we need to do anything more with the CSS. If we want, we can just close this to get rid of it. Going back to our HTML, the thing that I want to add, like I said, is the ability to display the number of users that we have in our database. So let's create this main div where we're going to put our main content using a span with an ID so that I can reference this element in JavaScript code when I have a value to update. So I'm going to make a request to the RESTful endpoint and I need to know which part of my HTML to change. So by having the span here enclosed this number five, which is the total, well, I'm going to call that user count and that is the element I'm going to target for change from JavaScript code. This is what I want. I want that when I click the button update, it should go fetch the number of users from our wrestle endpoint and then update the user count span. We need to write some JavaScript. One of the things I like doing is putting my JavaScript to load last instead of early on in the document. So I tend to move all JavaScript to the end of the HTML and make it the last set of elements before the body element. So I'm going to go run the application. But before I do, I want to install our plug our package. And since we have moved things around a bit, I had to go to the user directory and do go install to install that package. Now I could rerun our application. Our endpoint is listening. I can go back to our web browser. And what I want to do is be able to click update and have the value change from five to whatever. But let's do some testing first. So I'm going to use Postman to as my RESTful endpoint tester, you can use REST client. REST client and Postman are both utilities that you can use to do RESTful endpoint testing, and they're free. So search for them, install them. But here I can send a GET request. And as you can see, my application returns an empty array, which we expect because we just started our applications. So we don't have any users. But if I do post request instead, and I'm going to select body, and I want to use not form, but rather raw, and the type of thing I want, and I want to use JSON. I want to submit a JSON body. And so let's create a JSON document to represent a new user. And look at the results. Exactly what we expect. We get back an ID for our user, telling us our user was created and the username. Okay. We can then do a get and we get an array of that user. Let's create another user. Just as we expect, everything is working just as before. And of course, if we do a get, we get a list of users, which is exactly what we want in order to be able to determine how many total users we have. So we need to fix this so that when we do click the update button, we get the total number of users changes from this value we have of the default value of five to whatever number of users we have in our database. So let's write the JavaScript. So we're going to create a function, which we can call from HTML. And let's call this function get users. What does this function do? The function needs to submit a request to our server. For that, we can create an object called an XML HTTP request object, right? We're going to make a AJAX request to our server. So AJAX stands for asynchronous Java and XML. So we're going to make AJAX request. And one of the things we need to do is be able to use this X HTTP object to send a request to our backend. The request type that we're going to send, of course, is a get request. We're going to call the open method on the X HTTP request object and pass it the HTTP method we're trying to make, which is get the URL, which is where we're going to connect to. And in our case, we connect into HTTP localhost 8080 forward slash users forward slash. That's where our API endpoint is for users. And we're doing a get request and the true parameter. The third parameter is whether we should make an asynchronous call or not. 
This refers to the fact that if we do a synchronous call, then we will block until the request completes. Whereas if we do a synchronous call, then we don't have to wait until the request completes because we don't know how long it's going to take. And what we can do, then do is register a function that will get called once the request completes. And we'll write that function next. So we have the request open, then we can send it. Call by calling the send method. This will send our request, which is asynchronous, but we still need a way to know when the request completes. So now we have to define a function that will get called when our request completes. The function we're going to define, it's going to be saved on the property on ready state change. And so whatever function we have defined here is going to get called every time the state of our HTTP request object has a change. One of the change we're looking for is to see if the ready state is equals to four. Four is means that the request was sent and there was a response. And we also want to make sure that not only was the request complete, but that the status was 200 because the request was complete, but it could be like a bad request, like 400, for example. And so we don't care about that. We want to handle the case when it's successful. And the result of, of from that request, the response text is on the this that response object. The this here, if you don't know JavaScript, refers to the object on which this method is being called. So this is our XHTTP object. And so we want to do is call JSON parse on that text to turn to turn our JSON string into a JavaScript object. Once we have that, we can update the ID, the span that we called user dash count. And the way to do that is we have to get an handle of that ID. So I referenced it. So we say document that get element by ID and we give it the name of the element. And then we can set that, that inner HTML, that's the all the, con the content of that element to users that length. Remember, users represent our array that we got, JavaScript array that we got back from JSON when we converted our response text, JSON up document, JSON string to an object, which is a JavaScript array. And now we can just simplify things by using a variable, but it's the same thing. Do we need equal equal here instead of just equal sign? Let's zoom in, see what's going on. When we click update, nothing happened. Well, let's open developers console and see what error we get. So when we click here, yep, there's, there's suddenly an error. And so you can see it's telling you that the request, there was no, there was no access control allow option header in the response. So when we made our request, it did not say that our request should be allowed for this client. The only reason we get in this is because we have two things happening. We have our backend running as on port 8080. It is not serving up our front end application. Our front end is coming from somewhere else and which is the Python code, which is port 8000. So what we have is cross site scripting. And so that's CORS. So what we want to do is be able to handle the fact that each request must say, do I allow someone from another domain or another port to connect? Let's print out what value we're getting for the request that option. And we're going to see that oh, it's really just the host and port where our request is originating. What we want to see is for our request, what is the value of origin? And so if we select this again and rerun, but notice our it didn't work, even though we made change to our package and recompile it. And the reason is, is because our go.main still references the whole package directory. So if we type go doc here within the package directory, we'll see that in order to use this package directory, we have to import this new path, package path. And so let's go make those changes in our main.go file, which still uses the old location. Let's get rid of this. And everything should work fine now. Let's run our application because we've already built our package already. And now we click update and let's go and we can see the output is as we expected. It says get has origin equals this. So like I said, this is no surprise. This is the host and port where our client is connecting from. Our response needs to have this header saying that, oh, yes, anyone connecting from this origin is allowed to make requests to this endpoint. And so you can put these on any method you want so that only some method allow cross site scripting. It's really important to understand this because this is one way to secure your endpoint so that you can still restrict where those requests come from, either for by port or by host and port. So now, as you can see, we can update our page 
if we add some users and then we go click update again, as you can see, we're making a successful request to our backend from our client from JavaScript and we're getting the results back and we're updating our HTML. So this is really good. This is, this is a nice milestone because we have now tied our front end HTML client application to our backend and the two things are running separately. Our API is running on port 8080. Our front end is running on port 5500 because we're using this go live thing. But even if we start up another web server using Python, it would still work the exact same way. It would come from another port and it would still work. So this is a way now of scaling. You can imagine we're scaling out our front end and they're still talking to the same backend. So you can try that. So now this works. Let's now create a form. And we want a form that allows us to create new users. So for a form, we have to specify action. Action refers to once the form is submitted, where is it submitted to? Where's the RESTful endpoint? And for us, this is going to be the action URL here is going to be to our users. Also again, endpoint, but we're going to use a post instead. And notice for our form, we specify post as the method. Now let's create some inputs for our form. We want a username input. So I'm going to use, I'm going to use a label with a for attribute, specifying the name of the input that I want this label for. And then of course, I'm going to create an input of type text and give it the ID and name username. Now I'm going to create two other labels just like this, one for email and the other for password. The one for password is slightly different than the username one and email in that for the password, we should use input type password so that we can protect the user as they type their password. No one needs to see it as they type it. Now that we have a form with our input fields for us to create a new user, we need a button. And the reason for this button is so that we can say, well, now I've typed in information for our user. I want to be able to create the user or add the user. So let's add a button and we can do submit. And when a button of type submit is part of a form, what happens is when you click that button, it automatically gathers all the fields, the input values for that form and submit it to your endpoint specified there using the method you specify. Well, what this also means is that the web browser sort of redirects to that endpoint. So we don't want that. You can see from our application that we are getting a post. We don't know exactly what is submitted, but we are getting that post request. But what we want is the ability to control the submission a bit. And so let's just use a simple type of just button. And what we're going to do is we're going to use this the same way we've used our button to update our form, which is on click, we're going to call our own method called add user, for example. Let's test and see what happens. So if we go back, click this add user button and we get the same thing. It seems to, since it's part of this form, it's trying to submit the form. And that's not what we want. So what we're going to do is we want to cancel or prevent the default behavior. So let's go write a function called add user. To accomplish that, we need to pass in an event. The event we can get from the call. When we call the function, we can say pass in the event. And in the function, we can use the event to say prevent the default behavior by calling this method on the event. Now, if we go back and run our code, we'll see that it doesn't submit our form as before, but the function still gets called. But we can test that our method is being called, our function is being called by putting an alert. And now if we go back and we click the add user button, we can see that our alert function is being called and we're not trying to submit the form. So this is good. So what do we want to do here? Well, we already know how to get a user from a RESTful endpoint, get you a list of users. So why don't we do a post? Post is similar to get, of course, if you can remember what we did was use the XHTTP object. So why don't we just start off by just copying the code that we've already written and then modify it. That's going to save us some typing. So we know that we need an XHTTP request object. We also going to need a callback once our request is successful. What should we do? Well, if we're going to post and add users, I would say at the end of it, we want to update our total user count. So why don't we just call the function we already written that does that? So that's easy. If we have successfully created a new object, we should just automatically update the UI to reflect this. And instead of doing a get, we want to do a post. Now, when we go to send, instead of simply doing send, we have to send with some the data that we want for the post. And so that's going to be just this data we're going to eventually create. How are we going to collect the data we want to send? Now remember, we have to, we have, we have, have these input, we have these inputs in our form. So if we can just look them up and get access to our input elements, just like what we have access to our user count element, we can look up the other elements like username 
and we can print it out and see what we get. We can click update, that still works. And of course, if we click add, now we see that oh, there's a problem. But notice in our output, we also see that we have input of type user, you input with the ID user. So that's what a pong means, ID user. And if we scroll through the list, looking for which property has the value we're interested in, we'll see that it's not the name. We know the name is username. What we're looking for is the property that has Jane. And there it is. Property value has what we want. We can now create several variables to save the values from our form, from our form input. So we're going to create for username, email, and password. So now we have our values from the form. We're going to create object, which is essentially like a dictionary or a hash map, which says that we have a property username with a value from username, a property email with a value email, a property password with a value password. Now let's create a new object. So populate our fields, click add again. And this time we can see that we have a problem with property value. So where is this coming from? And oh, that's because we have an error here. So let's try this again. And we click add user. And we have a post request, which it looks good, but somehow it says it was unsuccessful, which means we have a 400. So if you remember when we wrote our code, our API code, we had, if you couldn't decode into a user object, then you had, you should list it as a bad request. Let's use the IOUtil read all function to read the data from our body and see what was being submitted. Why is it that we cannot parse this post data into a user object? Remember, we expect a JSON object. So let's make sure that we're getting a JSON object. We're going to use IOUtil read all to read the content of our request body. IOUtil read all returns two values. It returns a slice of bytes that it reads from the object that implements IO reader interface and also an error. We don't care about the error for now, so we're going to ignore it and just save the slice of byte in this variable B. Since a slice of byte can be cast to a string, we're going to cast it to a string and print it out to see exactly what we get. Of course, we may change to our packet, so we have to compile again, install it, and then we run our application. Now let's submit a new uh, user by doing a post. And let's see what is it that's being sent to our backend. Well, we know this is going to fail. So it says that what we're getting is just square brackets, object, object. You know, JavaScript, you will recognize that what we're really doing is we are actually just trying to send our object without turning it into JSON first. But we can use the JSON object inside of JavaScript to first stringify or encode our JavaScript object into a JSON string. And as we can see, now we're successfully encoding that object that we created into a JSON object. But our request is still failing because we have read all the data from our request body. So by the time our do post method is called, there's nothing else to read. The request body is empty. So if we remove that line and again, build and install our package, and of course, we have to stop and rerun our application, we should expect now that our request should be successful or post request should be successful. I remember for our add user, what we're doing is we're saying automatically call the update. And this is exactly what we have. We've added a user and notice how our user interface automatically updates to say one and therefore two. So now we have a full round trip of adding user and then calling a method to retrieve all the current users. It just so happened that we are just simply listing the total, showing the total, but we could have decided to just list, create a table and list them up. Now, we can get rid of the update button because we are not going to be calling that explicitly anymore. This is going to be done for us every time we add a user. We still have a problem though. We have this default value of five. It would be nice that when our application starts, it first fetches the number of users from the backend. So when we do a refresh, for example, it fetches the number of users from the backend and put it on the screen. So I'll leave that as an exercise for you to do. You already have the method. All you have to do is figure out which event gets fired once you document load and put that in the code. And now you can call that same get user method and everything should work just as before. That's it for now. See you in the next video.